Thank you for joining us. The following presentation is from a webinar titled, Cover Your Assets, Asset Protection Trusts, and the Vital Importance of Trust Jurisdiction, originally produced on January 23rd, 2014. The presenter is David Warren with Bridgeford Trust Company and Reed Hornberg with McConley and Asbury. Enjoy the presentation and visit us online at www.macpas.com for information about future events and upcoming webinars. Good afternoon and thank you for joining us. My name is Reed Hornberg and I'm going to be our host today for this uh, webinar. We have a great guest with us today. We have David Warren, uh, President and CD CEO with Bridgeford Trust Company. Uh, the title of today's webinar is going to be Cover Your Assets, Asset Protection Trust and the Vital Importance of Trust Jurisdiction. Let me tell you a little bit about McConley and Asbury. We are an audit, tax, and risk management accounting firm that serves the central Pennsylvania region. We also feature special capabilities in our private client services area, which is a focus on wealth and legacy planning. Our company has been featured as a best place to work in Pennsylvania nine times and has been voted to be a best accounting firm in the United States three times. And as I had mentioned, our special guest today is David Warren, the president and CEO of Bridgeford Trust Company. Prior to starting Bridgeford Trust Company, David was a practicing attorney and worked in the trust and estates industry for over 15 years. We have some great discussions planned for today, so I'm going to go ahead and give a quick overview of the topics we're going to touch on. We're going to begin by talking about the uh, an overview of the role that a trust company plays. Then we're going to dive into the pros and cons of CITUS, which means the jur jurisdiction of the trust. We're then going to talk about an explanation and application of domestic asset protection trusts. And then Dave's going to discuss the question of liability and potential malpractice within trust in regard to asset protection. Then we're going to give a recap, and we're going to have a great time. Okay, Dave, let's start with the basics. Can you tell us a little bit about what a trust company is? Thanks, Reed. Sure. Um, a trust company and trust powers generally uh, allow uh, for assets to be held uh, as a uh, separate in a separate entity and so we can do that with a trust company uh, commonly referred to as a corporate trustee or an independent trustee can also exercise these types of powers um, but when talking about a corporate trustee which is uh, where I come from and, and what Bridgeford Trust is it's a state chartered entity um, and again it has the power granted to it by the state uh, a particular state to hold assets now it's not just investable assets which is what pe people typically think of uh, it's also uh, can be closely held stock real estate artwork any type of uh, property uh, and I think often people get confused and think of trust companies and, and, and as only investment managers and in fact they're much bigger than that um, they're not brokers they're not in registered investment advisors and in fact the regulation is very very different and that's an important point to think about uh, actually throughout the whole presentation uh, you hear the word fiduciary a lot and that's in the news a lot in fact with respect to asset management generally but trust companies, in many ways, uh, began to 300 years ago. They were probably the first legal fiduciary, at least institutional legal fiduciary. And so that carries with it uh, some important definitions um, that can be distilled down to the idea that the trust company always, always, always has to act in the best interest of um, the trust, uh, the beneficiaries, the settler. Uh, and the remainder men, um, often and those interests uh, are not always uh, in conjunction with one another, which makes the role of a trust company so uh, vital and, and, and um, somewhat uh, difficult at times. Um, and we talk about functions and duties. Generally, uh, there is the ability to manage uh, and the power to manage investable assets. Um, but there's also, uh, as I indicated, it's much larger than that. Um, you have the ability to to pay bills. You have the ability to act really on behalf of uh, the beneficiaries or the settler, more particularly. And uh, and when you would need one, really, is uh, there's a myriad of reasons. Often you hear trusts talked about in conjunction with estate planning uh, to mitigate taxation. 
Um, we spend a lot of time at Bridgeford Trust actually focusing on uh, dynasty trust issues, dynasty planning issues, which is really trying to inculcate the values into the next generation. So often our clients are um, certainly concerned about taxation, but more concerned about control and making sure these assets last um, in perpetuity, um, which is a fancy way of, I guess, saying forever. Um, and uh, corporate versus independent trustee, I mentioned that earlier, um, that's an important distinction. Um, you know, over the years, uh, there has been a focus more on independent trustee to serve in this capacity. Um, I think the pendulum is swinging uh, definitely back into uh, the area of corporate trustees because they're professionals. Um, there are a lot of issues uh, that need to be um, uh, dealt with and an expertise that really only a corporate trustee has, particularly with respect <clears throat> to the issues that we're going to be talking about today. Uh, these are technical issues, there are technical administrative issues, uh, in many cases legal issues, that often an independent trustee who ends up being Uncle Tom or, or somebody's brother or, or maybe another professional um, just doesn't have the expertise to handle. So traditionally, people have... Um, uh, shied away from independent trustees because of that, and with the uh, acknowledgement that corporate trustees just have a lot more experience, uh, professionalism, and insurance for that matter. If 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 there's a mistake made, corporate trustees carry a lot of insurance, and uh, clients tend to like the fact that we're insured. Another important point to mention is corporate trustees do not die, um, which is uh, kind of a funny way of uh, making that point. But um, when individuals set up trusts. Uh, they want to have a relationship with a trustee that they expect to be there uh, potentially forever. And uh, independent trustees obviously can pass away, and corporate trustees, as I indicated, do not as institutions. Um, this corporate versus independent trustee concept is also very, very important as we go through this discussion, because a corporate trustee is really the only way to establish trust jurisdiction in an alternative trust state uh, that is more advantageous for the planning process, and, and that'll make more sense as we go through the presentation. Um, specifically, what I mean by that is there are very powerful advantages to considering other trusts, or rather other states, to cite us or, or have your trust um, uh, have a different jurisdiction in a different state. So an individual trustee can establish that assuming they had, live in Delaware or they live in, in South Dakota, but clients in Delaware or excuse me, in Pennsylvania or New Jersey typically don't have an individual that they know that lives in a different state. So they have to look to corporate trustees uh, who have trust powers and who are chartered in states such as South Dakota and Delaware and others that we'll mention later uh, in order to... Um, avail themselves of the uh, of the advantages and there are real advantages which we're going to talk about in a minute dave that is very useful information um in that vein of talking about the difference between a corporate trustee and an individual trustee and why the location matters which i think you're going to get more into uh shortly can you tell us a little bit about your company, Bridgeford Trust Company, and why you decided to use, use South Dakota for your charter. Absolutely. And it was uh, probably the most important decision we made when we were uh, conceiving Bridgeford Trust Company and ultimately launching it. Um, not all states are created equal, and this is actually a topic that I'm very passionate about. Um, as we'll talk about throughout the presentation, um, there are a handful of states that have ascended to the uh, uh, to the top in the United States relative to um, trust and and trust planning and the and the availability to do some very very um, progressive uh, and leading edge uh, type of planning uh, for particularly wealthy individuals. So when we conceived Bridgeford Trust Company, we knew because of the type of client that we wanted to serve and in fact are serving now, that those particular clients needed leading edge trust solutions and the ability to have access to asset protection, which they don't have in Pennsylvania, or the ability to, to avoid taxation in certain areas, or the ability to have um, 
really rock solid privacy provisions, which do not exist in Pennsylvania. And so Bridgeford um, ultimately settled on South Dakota because in our estimation at the time, uh, that was one of the best jurisdictions. And in fact, um, as we'll talk about, there are four jurisdictions that are considered to be really the top trust jurisdictions in the nation because of progressive trust laws. And um, really probably in this order, uh, and this isn't the opinion of David Warren or Bridgeford Trust Company or, or certainly McCulley and Asbury, but it's the opinion of, of uh, law professors and, and uh, people in the industry who publish charts. We're going to see one of those later in the, in the, in the program. Um, but it, probably in this order, South Dakota, Alaska, Nevada, and Delaware. Those four are considered, without a doubt, the top tier trust jurisdictions. Um, and uh, and and uh, so again, when we decided to launch Bridgeford, we knew we needed to be in one of those states. Uh, settled on South Dakota for numerous reasons. Um, asset protection was one of them, which is really the main topic of of this webinar. Um, and in that capacity, we built a really a powerful team of experienced trust legal and accounting professionals around um, the South Dakota Trust Charter. Uh, so we have offices in South Dakota. We have offices in, in Pennsylvania, uh, Camp Hill, and Lancaster. And because of South Dakota law and reciprocity with Pennsylvania, we're able to service uh, um, South Dakota Trust right here in Pennsylvania, um, actually around the country, uh, and also because of the fact that we are considered a foreign fiduciary here in Pennsylvania, we're also able to handle Pennsylvania Trusts. Uh, so, although we are considered a South Dakota trust company, we have the ability to really do any type of fiduciary work that any other trust company can do uh, within the proverbial four corners of Pennsylvania. Uh, and because of these unique and very progressive trust laws that that uh, we're governed, uh, that govern us, um, we have the ability and, in fact, the desire to work with non-traditional assets such as real estate, closely held stock, and insurance. And in fact, we we're we're, we're excited about that business and 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 are happy to fill a niche that, frankly, a lot of insurance um, a lot of trust companies uh, uh, don't want that work anymore. A lot of trust companies have designed themselves around being uh, asset managers. That's the kind of work that they want, um, and that's uh, that's only probably one fifth or one sixth of what a trust company should be doing for their clients. So that's interesting that you Bridgeford has the capability to work as a South Dakota trust, but also to service clients right in Pennsylvania. Um, now, can you tell us a little bit more about? Um, Working with people in Pennsylvania, are you able to work with other groups, other teams, and things like that that also service the trust? Absolutely. Um, you see on the slide there, uh, collaborative. That's a very, very important aspect of what we do. Um, we, we've ultimately built ourselves around the idea of a multifamily office, and there's a couple of different approaches to that. Ours is collaborative and open. Um, I guess another way of saying that is sort of an open, open architecture approach. So, under the South Dakota um, umbrella, I suppose, uh, we were able to work with, we'll call them partners, maybe it's an overused word, but uh, but teams. We work with outside investment managers. We, we do not have an in-house investment capability on purpose. Uh, we wanted to be independent. Um, independence is a common theme, uh, an important theme, in fact, of Bridger from the beginning. Um, we work with outside counsel, attorneys, outside CPAs, um, outside insurance folks. The idea is, because of the South Dakota Charter, we're able to do some very, very sophisticated planning, and we want to work with the best of the best. And we concede, um, as a multifamily office approach, that um, we're not experts in everything other than perhaps trust planning and wealth planning and, and trust administration. And we look outside uh, in many ways to experts, in most ways, in fact, to experts outside of our four walls. And um, it works very, very well. Can you give us a quick layman's term definition of what you mean by multifamily office? Certainly. You know, read over the years, uh, wealth management and asset management. There's all these different kind of words that have been used, phrases to, to try to define our industry. And um, this seems to be sort of the hot phrase right now. Everybody calls themselves a family office or a multifamily office. When 10 years ago, everybody became wealth managers. And uh, 10 years ago, nobody knew what a wealth manager was either because you would have an insurance person said he was a wealth manager. But... So did the investment manager. Well, we all know they're very different um, disciplines. Um, the concept of a multifamily office really grew out of families like the Rockefeller family and uh, DuPont family and other very, very large families who had so many assets that they made their own office uh, comprised of attorneys and investment professionals and uh, CPAs. 
And the idea was they wanted to have individual consular type services that not only provided trust work uh, and, and in legal work and accounting work, but also did things like training the, training the next generation to receive the wealth or, or training the next generation to take over the, the, um, the business. That has blossomed into the idea of a multifamily office. So you have families that are in the 15 to $20 million mark um, or higher who want that same type of high, super high touch focus on planning and independence. Independence is the big, big word there, Reed. Everybody wants independence and they don't necessarily get that at a bank in New York Mellon or a PNC or, or some of the other uh, larger trust companies. So they're seeking independence. And that's, again, sort of the hallmark of what is a family office or multifamily office. And that's what we bring to the table, which, again, is why we're so focused on bringing um, experts from outside of Bridgeford to be part of our, our service team. So the idea of this family office not only focuses on sort of the hard aspects of planning, but also the touchy feely aspects of it, which has um, been referred to, that's how it's been referred to, which is again, training the next generation uh, and uh, making sure the next generation knows how to handle wealth. I mean, Reed, it's really interesting. If you look at the demographic of um, large wealth and where it's moving, uh, you know, we all, of course, we always talk about what's going to happen when the baby boomers retire. And I'm not talking about that kind of demographic. I'm talking about these dynasty trusts that have been in place for hundreds of years. A lot of them are at banks like Bank of New York Mellon, uh, JP Morgan. When you talk to those folks who leave those institutions, they're not going from Bank of New York Mellon to JP Morgan. They're going from Bank of New York Mellon to small multifamily office trust companies uh, like Bridgeford and others around the country. Um, and again, that's just not David Warren's opinion. That's, that's, that's tracked demographically. And they're leaving because they want high touch. They want consular type services. They want the types of services that I've talked about. And now, under the Uniform Trust Act and, and, and to canting statutes and all these other technical aspects of, of trust planning, which, which has become very, very exciting, People can leave those big institutions, can select which state they want to be in, and the multifamily office model is the most compelling platform to do that. And so that's really essentially how we've built Bridgeford, or why we built Bridgeford, rather, in that model. And we're very excited about the, the jurisdiction we selected, and it's uh, proven to be a, a very powerful model, not only in Pennsylvania, but frankly, across the country. Thank you, Dave. That was a great background on kind of the history of Bridgeford. Um, in that vein, can you give us some specifics on what helped you to make the choice in deciding to go with South Dakota for Bridgeford Trust? Well, again, as we indicated, there are four states that really have ascended to the to the top of the list relative to trust jurisdiction. And um, in our estimation, uh, as we were doing our due diligence, South Dakota quickly rose to the to the very top. Part of that had to do with their rules and regulations relative to launching a trust company in that state and our ability to operate in Pennsylvania and other states. Um, but objectively speaking, uh, as you see there on the slide, uh, you know, very numerous publications, including Trust in the States magazines and magazine and others, have routine, they routinely rape South Dakota as the best or one of the best uh, trust jurisdictions. And that's because of, uh, which is really the focus of this presentation, their asset protection statute is, is one of the most robust, if not, I would argue, the ro ro most robust um, in the country. Um, and then the idea that there's no state taxation on trust assets. That's an important point, and we're not going to belabor that so much uh, for the purposes of this presentation, but it's, it's very important in Pennsylvania for Pennsylvania residents to understand that there's a recent case that the appellate court just uh, decided indicating that, in fact, um, a, a trust that has jurisdiction in another state like South Dakota is not subject to Pennsylvania income tax. Now, uh, important distinction there, um, income that is, is distributed to a beneficiary, that's taxable, but the trust itself is not taxed uh, to the extent that assets are not uh, within the four walls of Pennsylvania. For example, investment assets, uh, liquid assets, uh, things like that. That's, that's a big, big deal and, and, a, and a big development in, in the area. Uh, privacy was also another important aspect, the type of clients that we work with. Uh, privacy is vitally important. Um, there is uh, unequivocally, unequivocally, South Dakota has the most powerful trust or privacy provisions uh, in the country. And in fact, I've heard some commentators say in the whole world, uh, the, the contents of the trust, the beneficiaries, the assets, they cannot be discovered. Uh, and that's under court seal. 
Uh, so those are generally the reasons why we're there. Uh, yeah, and it's played well, very well for our clients since our inception. So Dave, we've heard you mention a few times and we've heard you refer to asset protection trust. Can you tell me what that is? Is that a, a different kind of trust or is that a characteristic or trait of every trust? Definitely not a characteristic of every trust. Um, the idea of asset protection, uh, Reed, you, you probably have heard this uh, over the years and I'm sure our audience has, is... is um, in order to protect assets, uh, people have gone offshore, typically. They've gone to the Cayman Islands or the Cook Islands, and for years and years and years, you hear of these tax, um, these tax havens uh, countries. Oh, yeah. I saw the movie The Firm. <laughs> absolutely. Um, absolutely. Well, about 20, 25 years ago, the United States, particularly, I believe, with South Dakota, it may have been Delaware, uh, thought, well, why, would, why should our wealthy clients have to go offshore to, to obtain asset protection? Um, we can create laws in this country that provide similar type of asset protection uh, that typically people would go uh, offshore to uh, achieve. And so this idea of a domestic, domestic asset protection trust was born. And essentially what makes it so different and what makes it uh, unlike any other trust is that this is a self-settled trust. And that's very, very important because, Reed, you can establish a trust. Um, that a domestic asset protection trust that shields your assets from creditors, including uh, future spousal claims. And we'll talk about that uh, in a couple of minutes. And essentially what happens here is that it shields those assets from third party liability. So if you uh, are sued um, and uh, there's a judgment entered against you, the assets in that trust can't be touched. If you, um, if there are any sort of creditor claim against you, um, if you have any sort of, uh, anybody coming after you for any reason, in most respects, cannot pierce that trust to get at those assets. Now, what makes this so unique and the 15 or 16 states that have asset protection trusts so compelling is the idea, again, that it's self-settled. So just because those trust, those assets are protected doesn't mean you don't have access to them or doesn't mean you don't have control. So in other words, you can still derive a benefit from this trust, from these trusts. That is a very, very important compelling of asset protection trust. You can receive income from the assets that you put into the trust. You can invade principal uh, as long as it's consistent with the trust document and properly administered from the corp by the corporate trustee, which is, a, which is another reason why corporate trustees are so important here. Um, all while enjoying um, some pretty powerful asset protection. Okay, I'll start right now. Now, these trusts are irrevocable, but again, what makes them so different than uh, uh, an irrevocable trust, a traditional irrevocable trust, is that there is the access, the control, and the ability to derive a benefit. And that's what makes them so compelling. It's very important uh, for people to understand that not all states have asset protection trusts and that Pennsylvania does not have an asset protection trust statute. Um, in order to have asset protection, just as you would to get it offshore in the Cooks Island, you'd have to go to a state uh, in the United States that has uh, asset protection and asset protection statute uh, on the books. David, thank you for that recap on domestic asset protection trusts. Uh, now, I'm interested, um, you had mentioned that South Dakota does have asset protection and Pennsylvania does not. Can you tell us a little bit more about the other states that do have it? Absolutely. There are 14 states, um, potentially now 15 after the first of the year, that have passed some sort of asset protection statute. Um, but they're not all created equally, just like generally the trust laws among the states in the, in the United States. Uh, consistently, South Dakota, Nevada, Alaska, and Delaware are recognized as having the most robust and powerful asset protection statutes in the nation. Again, that's not the opinion of Bridgeford or David Warren or McCulley and Asbury. Uh, that's the opinion of, of, of scholars and practitioners uh, in the marketplace. And there, and there are two points I wanted to make, actually, before we move on. One is, this concept is, is not going away. Uh, this The first time I heard of asset pro domestic asset protection trusts, I was still practicing law. And at the time, it was a very hot topic. It was somebody from Delaware, and, and there was a lot of skepticism about them at that point, at that point, as to would they really hold up in court, and... And they really do. They really provide a shield, and, and they seem too good to be true. 
But, you know, 20 years later, these trusts are not going away. Courts have consistently upheld them uh, as, a, as, a, as a powerful shield for assets. Um, and, and in fact, uh, the concept of asset protection generally has, has become a real industry. There are people, this is all they do. There are attorneys and accountants and trust companies like Bridgeford. This is all we focus on is asset protection. Uh, and um, so, again, that point is it's not going away. It has been tested. Uh, it has been proven to be a very valuable planning tool. And the other point I wanted to make is asset protection just doesn't obviously apply to your investment account. Um, our clients, uh, particularly high net worth clients, have other types of assets to worry about protecting, like real estate, closely held stock, uh, artwork, automobiles, other types of non-traditional assets I mentioned earlier in the presentation. All of those types of assets are certainly able to be put in an asset protection trust as well. And in fact, frankly, a lot of the asset protection trusts that we work with at Bridgeford at this point are primarily composed of non-traditional assets like that. So this tool is not only an important planning concept just for your you know, couple of million dollar investment account that you'd want to protect. Um, from a creditor or a lawsuit, but also your business. So this is a, a very important planning tool. Uh, again, we're going to talk about in a couple of minutes, applicable to business owners, uh, uh, physicians, anybody who's in a high-risk type of an environment where they could be sued, um, a domestic asset protection trust uh, in conjunction with perhaps some other type of planning is, again, an extremely powerful planning tool uh, that really needs to be discussed with the, in the planning process. Now, very briefly, I, I want to comment on you know, wh what is it that makes one state better than another relative to asset protection, and why is it that I think perhaps or many people think that South Dakota or, or, or Nevada leads the pack in this respect. Um, there are really four main factors, uh, and then they get expanded upon relative to another chart that I'm going to show you. But basically, the, the, the commentators and the scholars look at asset protection states, and they ask the following questions. Do they tax the trust? Uh, as we talked about, is there taxation on the trust as an entity? Um, the fraudulent conveyance statute, which we'll come back to in a second, um, is there a spousal or a child support exception? This is a very controversial aspect. Um, only a handful of states look at this point. Uh, and really what it's saying is, uh, can an asset protection trust shield claims from spouses for spousal support and child support. There's a big public policy debate on the books. A lot of folks believe that uh, that shouldn't be permitted, but in fact it is. It's per permitted not only in uh, South Dakota, but also Nevada. And then privacy provisions. Uh, we talked about that briefly. Uh, you know, if you can't find the trust, or at least if you can't discover the details of it, then how can you really attach uh, to it in a lawsuit or, or creditor action? Uh, so really, privacy probably should be at the top. And as I indicated, South Dakota has the most compelling, and I use that word a lot, but it really applies here, the most compelling privacy provisions in the country, if, if not the world. Now, Dave, you brought along a chart that we're going to share here um, that lists the rankings of domestic asset protection trust states. Can you uh, dive into a little more detail about what this chart is telling us? Absolutely. I, I've mentioned several times that um, uh, these these decisions or these opinions about uh, which states have ascended to the top uh, in the United States relative to different aspects of trust planning um, is not my opinion or Bridge or Trust's opinion. It's really based on the opinion of, of some very, very bright people. And one of them is, is an attorney in Nevada. Uh, his name is Steve Oceans. And um, he has prepared these really great charts that do an excellent job in a, in a very third-party sort of objective way of looking at various aspects uh, of a domestic asset protection trust, and um, and and places weights as you can see on on um, different factors that, in his opinion and the opinion of of, of scholars and other legal experts. Um, make these states better than others. And so as you see from this chart, um, and it's pretty easy to follow, and what I like about it is he puts a total score all the way to the, to the right. That's nice. Yeah, it, it really, it's, it's, it, it's sort of unassailable in many ways because there's no subjectivity here. Uh, and, and that's, again, what I think is great about it. Nevada is ranked number one, uh, obviously, as you can see. South Dakota is number two. Uh, they're very close, and in fact, um, they're almost indistinguishable in terms of their statutes. Uh, the, the only the main difference is the spousal and child support exception. Um, you see, Nevada there has no exception, which means that. 
people can establish an asset protection trust and, and never have to pay alimony or child support out of that trust. South Dakota recently, within the last couple of months, changed their statute to be much like the statute in Nevada, making really the two states virtually indistinguishable relative to um, relative to um, uh, how they incorporate into an overall state plan. What is interesting, though, read about this chart, is how far Delaware is on the list. What you typically see uh, and have heard about, particularly in the Northeast, is Delaware being the place to go for asset protection or Delaware being a great... For all financial. For all financial. And in fact, for many years, that's absolutely true, particularly when you want to incorporate a new business. Um, but not true anymore in the trust space. And, and, and it's primarily because states like South Dakota, Nevada, Alaska, and others have decided that they want to be the leader in, uh, in, in, in the trust world. So they've spent the time and the money to develop these statutes that make it more attractive. Particularly true in the asset protection space. Delaware has fallen primarily for a couple of reasons. And one is the point that I want to go back to uh, that I said I would get into more details is the idea of fraudulent conveyance. Fraudulent conveyance is a fancy way of saying look back. And in the asset protection space, this is probably the most important aspect of evaluating which statutes are better uh, over from one state to another. There, as the chart indicates, um, two years has become sort of the industry standard. So let's use an example, Reed. You establish a trust, an asset protection trust. Um, the fraudulent conveyance statute says, look, you can't establish a trust knowing that you're about to be sued. Mm -hmm. You can't do it. You can't. That's the fraudulent conveyance piece. You can't fraudulently move something out of your estate just because you think it's going to be seized. Right. So they put sort of a, an arbitrary number on there. And they say, okay, after two years of you having to establish the trust, we're going to presume, presume that there is no way that you knew that you were um, uh, specifically going to be sued. So after two years, the protection attaches. And at that point, you have full asset protection, and all those assets are, are protected, as we discussed. In Delaware, however, and other states further down on the chart, it's four years. That additional two years is, is a big deal in our industry. And which is even more exciting, I think, about the changes in South Dakota is that that's retroactive, which is to mean that if, if there's an individual who has established an asset protection trust in Delaware and it has been in an existence for two years and a day, uh, that day they can move that trust very easily from Delaware to South Dakota and immediately, immediately have asset protection. And would that apply only f if it was in another state that also had asset protection? Yes. Okay. That's a great point, Reed. It would. So there's, we know that there are 16 states that have an asset protection statute. Um, within those uh, trusts, there's a provision called the spendthrift provision and other, other sort of technicalities that make them asset protection. Uh, it's trust, also the idea that they're self-settled. Um, but this look-back period, this fraudulent conveyance aspect of asset protection trust is vitally important to understand and has uh, um, been the reason why uh, I think Nevada and South Dakota and Alaska have ascended to the top. And you see Ohio there made a big jump. Uh, they, were at way, they, they, they just made their asset protection statute uh, law, and they uh, kind of stretched the envelope and made it a year and a half. Um, again, it's an exciting aspect. I talk a lot and read, you've heard me say this in other contexts, the, 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 the dynamic nature of trust planning and what's happening across the country is fascinating. Um, trust planning, uh, is actually, uh, become so dynamic and exciting that it, you have to pay close attention to what's happening year over year because these states are just in a race to become the best trust jurisdiction. And, and I think so much of it settles on asset protection. Uh, that was, again, a big reason for Bridgeford Trust going to South Dakota for our trust charter. Uh, and I think it's a, a cornerstone for all planning for business owners or should be a cornerstone for all business owners, uh, physicians, or anybody in a high-risk profession. So we've talked a lot about all the different benefits that they provide can you go into some specific useful applications of why someone would, would be able to utilize an asset protection trust? Sure. We talked generally about uh, certain types of individuals that would uh, probably be most interested in asset protection trusts or who, who are more typically asking about asset protection. So there's any business owner, I would argue that any business owner 
that has an ownership stake in, his, in, in, in her business or, or his business would be interested in asset protection. Um, I think of physicians, particularly who, as we all know, are sued all the time. I think they generally should be considering asset protection strategies. I think these trusts are, are perfect to consider in conjunction with other types of planning. Um, I think really anybody who finds themselves in an, in, a, in a situation where they're worried about liability, and, and frankly, you know, you don't have to be a physician to be worried about liability. I mean, we all carry liability uh, every day uh, while walking across the street, or in fact, driving our car. It's very possible that we could create a, a, an accident or a situation that results in a legal settlement that far exceeds your insurance. And and I hear it often. Well. Uh, Dave, we don't need asset protection trusts here because we have plenty of insurance. Well, as a formal attorney uh, and having worked with physicians, uh, particularly, I've seen several times where physicians uh, have been sued and, and judgments uh, uh, were rendered well in excess of their insurance policies. And they didn't do proper planning and they had the right checks out of their personal accounts and in some cases bankrupt them, had bankrupt them. Uh, so I've seen firsthand how just a little bit of planning in the asset protection space makes a big difference. Um, but more specifically, I wanted to talk today about what I believe to be a pretty um, progressive planning tool that not a lot of people think about. And I get this question a lot uh, from our clients and other advisors that we work with, which is how can an asset protection trust be used in the context of context rather in the context of premarital planning? Anybody getting married, whether you know it's a man or woman, uh, particularly a second marriage, um, or who, who bringing uh, uh, large assets to a marriage and they may have children, pre-existing children, and anybody in that category is going to be concerned about how to best protect assets that you're bringing into the marriage. Um, we all know that divorces can be ugly, uh, painful, and expensive, and and we've all heard the horror stories of of uh, losing half of uh, uh, individuals losing half of their value in a company that they've built for you know 50 years of their lives, or or losing um, half of their homes, or or whatever. And um, in this space, an asset protection trust is an extremely powerful planning tool. You know, in the absence of proper premarital planning, as as uh, we're discussing, a, a spouse is a, entitled in most states to equitable distribution of property brought to the marriage. And typically, what we see are prenuptial agreements in that space. And a prenuptial agreement, uh, as as most of you know and read, I'm sure you're familiar with, is it's it's a, it's a legal document uh, that raises many personal legal issues that, um, frankly, often deter deter couples from signing them. When I used to practice law, I, I worked with, with um, some higher net worth folks who hated the idea of having to even talk about uh, their assets with their, uh, their, their spouse or the, the proposed spouse. And, and they didn't like the idea of having to say, hey, would you, I love you. I love you very much. And I want to spend the rest of my life with you and share everything with you. But hey, how about you sign this document? Because, uh, <laughs> because uh, I don't trust you that much. Um, that tends to get in the way of marital bliss. And so... Um, Often premarital agreements, which which generally work okay, um, they're easy to attack in some states and, and aren't always as rock solid as people think they are. Um, but often they're not even signed. Even before we, you know, I mean, it's it's fine if you have them signed, they might work. But but the conversation ultimately uh, doesn't happen as much as it should. And um, and so practitioners have looked for alternative ways to plan around this. And um, they've looked for ways to, to protect assets without having to have this conversation um, with the uh, intending spouse. And um, the Domestic Asset Protection Trust has become, in many respects, the perfect vehicle uh, to shield assets uh, that otherwise um, would become marital assets and up for marital um, division, or rather not marital division, but, but I guess uh, spousal division at, at, a, at a divorce. And it's particularly useful in the contents of somebody that has uh, a business interest or owns business, owns a business uh, in some capacity. So here's how this works. And I'm going to juxtapose this uh, with how a prenuptial agreement would work would work in this context. In a prenuptial agreement arena, in most cases, the spouse with the assets has to disclose everything to the, uh, to the intended spouse. And there's typically a timing requirement. So these agreements have to be signed 
um, well enough in advance so that the, uh, the the spouse, the other spouse, has the opportunity to really make an informed decision. So, so prenuptial agreement really can't be just handed to uh, somebody right before marriage. And yeah, it say, can't be like the day of kind exactly, of thing. Okay. Exactly. And courts are pretty clear on that. Um, and and those are the, the really the, the two things that are typically attacked um, when these things are challenged. And so. Um, particularly, I think probably the, the, the biggest challenge there is, is the disclosure requirement. Um, and there's also, a, in many states, the, the requirement that the spouse buy or buy, hire an attorney uh, to review the document and, and in order to make sure that um, the, the, the prenuptial agreement is something that is fair. There's a fairness component to it in some states. The point I'm making is there's a lot of requirements and there's a lot of hoops to jump through here. And, and frankly, um, th there's a way to avoid all of that by just uh, doing some simple domestic asset protection planning using a domestic asset protection trust. As I indicate here, there's no disclosure requirement and there's no timer requirement. Uh, so really read, uh, we use you as an example again. If you're about to get married and you're coming in, this is your second marriage and, and, and you, you are going to bring um, a significant amount of assets that you've acquired prior to marriage uh, that you don't want to be taken from you uh, mm -hmm. if you have a, a divorce. Um, you can create a domestic asset protection trust. You can do it the day before you get married. You can sign it minutes before you, have your, you, you, you uh, say your wedding vows and it's enforceable. Um, so there's no time and requirement. There's no documents to execute relative to your your spouse. Um, you don't have to get any acquiescence. You never have to discuss. You never have to discuss it with her at all. And what it does is it transfers your interest in your business. It transfers your interest in, in various different assets that you own into this trust that, upon divorce, is impenetrable. So the corpus of the trust can't or the trust itself can't be pierced to satisfy or otherwise be divided for purposes of of uh, of equitable distribution so it, it accomplishes many of the same things that a prenuptial agreement uh, is intended to accomplish uh, but it does it in a way without the requirement of the formalities mm -hmm. and it does it in a way that avoids probably most importantly it avoids uncomfortable conversations and and particularly confront confrontational conversations uh, and and I have seen, and, and commentators have have uh, have con continue to, to to indicate this. That also reduces the chances of a successful attack um, through the equitable distribution process. I mean, as we know, these divorces are pretty contestable, yeah. and they get mean and nasty. And um, this, by using an asset protection strategy, either in conjunction with a prenup or just just without a prenup, just using it in lieu of a prenup. Um, it really removes that argument. It takes that argument off the table. Uh, as long as they're created correctly, and as long as they're administered correctly, which again points out the importance of a corporate trustee who knows what they're doing here, mm -hmm. um, they're virtually impenetrable. So we're seeing these used more and more and more in a premarital planning context. And I like to talk about it when we discuss asset protection with our clients, because often people don't think about it. Family law attorneys don't, don't think about it. Their mind typically goes right to just doing a prenup. But I, I think, as we've established pretty clearly, prenups certainly have their place. I, I'm not here to say not to use them. Um, but there's a way to avoid a lot of the hassle here and get the type of protection that, that you would like. And um, I've seen it work very, very well in the domestic, uh, work very, very well by using an asset protection trust. And it's just uh, just a lot easier, and uh, and I would argue, as I said earlier, uh, less likely of of a successful attack. Wow, Dave, those are some pretty strong arguments for you know why you would want to do this. Are there any uh, downsides or caveats? Absolutely, I think there are three main points that uh, the practitioner is, is going to want to think think through. One is that the trust has to be set up absolutely correctly, and it's not hard to do that. But there are a lot of um, not a lot. There are some requirements that that have to be met, and it and it applies to any trust formation, uh, not just asset protection trusts. And all trusts, when created, should be done correctly. So the language uh, has to be current and has to be consistent with the state law. Um, it has to be uh, domiciled in the in the state, which is to say that a, a, a South Dakota Asset Protection Trust has to be administered in South Dakota. So in our instance, Bridgeford Trust has an office there. Um, the trust document has to be housed there, and our trust administrator in South Dakota, um, one of the two of them, have to be responsible for administering that trust, and all the record-keeping aspect of it has to be in South Dakota. Um, 
and uh, and um, so that's a very important aspect of it. Um, it has to be signed before the marriage, which I, I think I made that point, but it's it's that's vitally important. So Reed, you can't come to me the next day and say, Hey, you know, I, I really I want I made a mistake. <laughs> exactly. Well there'll be lots of I'll be sorry for you on many fronts. But um but specifically once you're married, you, you you can't do this. And that becomes a fraudulent conveyance, which we talked about earlier. Um and the idea that it's administered correctly is extraordinarily important. I mean, I mentioned it, it has to be properly administered within the jurisdiction that, that we choose. But we can't create a trust here and, and sort of treat it as our personal bank account. Um, that applies really generally for any type of asset protection trust for any purpose. But you can't come to me as the corporate trustee and say, Dave, yeah, I need this distribution um, and uh, I need a principal distribution and, 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 and don't worry about why. I mean, we have to follow the rules here. So um, let's sort of switch gears and, and talk about why I say that. In the event that there's a divorce, as we've, as we've said several times, it gets mean and nasty. The attorney, the first thing they're going to do upon discovering that there's a domestic asset protection trust in place is, well, first, they're not going to be happy about it because uh, they know how hard they are to pierce. And really, the only way they can pierce them, Reed, is to hit or find uh, a weakness. And in this case, if it wasn't set up correctly, if it's not administered correctly in the state, um, or if I, as Bridgeford Trust Company, have not followed my due diligence in following the terms and conditions of the trust document. So it's a it's a phenomenal deterrent from an attorney. Or it's a, excuse me, it's a phenomenal deterrent in, in litigation. Once a lot of attorneys, once they realize that there is a domestic a domestic asset protection trust, they, a lot of them just walk away because they don't they they think they can't pierce it. However, lawyers are clever um, and they figure out ways around things. And what they've been doing is just because one exists now, they get into they start to subpoena the trust company, they start to ask questions, and they start to look for ways to prove that the trust was a sham or the trust isn't correctly administered. So I think the most important caveat to mention today is make sure it's done correctly. Uh, make sure you have a corporate trustee that knows what they're doing. Uh, and make sure that um, uh, all the T's are, are sort of crossed and I's are dotted. Uh, that way it's not susceptible to an attack from an attorney who I can assure you um, now, uh, I think more so now as they come to understand them, um, they will attack and, 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 and put the trust company under a microscope to see if they made any mistakes. Well, Dave, thank you so much. I mean, you've done such a, a great job of explaining this clearly. Even I'm picking up on, I think, everything that you're trying to, to get across here. Um, so my, my question would be is, it just seems so obvious, are all trusts and trustees using these to their advantage? Actually, no. And I think that is somewhat... I think uh, frustrating for for those of us in in this space who who know that these planning tools are available. Um, you know, there are a couple of aspects to your question. Um, you know, I spent a lot of time talking to attorneys and accountants around the country, and and um, what I'm hearing a lot is, in many respects is people aren't as familiar with asset protection. They don't realize it can be used in a premarital context. They uh, some people are still skeptical of asset protection, domestic asset protection trust generally. Um, and probably maybe the most frustrating thing that I and my, my colleagues have, have continued to hear is um, people challenging whether it makes sense to even consider alternative trust jurisdiction at all. Um, I think what we've shown in this discussion is selecting proper trust jurisdiction is vital. And, you know, I've, I've, I've seen this quote and, and repeated it several times, but I adamantly believe that the decision to uh, uh, as to where to place your trust, which jurisdiction is going to apply to the trust, is as important as the decision to create a trust in the first place. Uh, and I think that um, that is very, very clear to me, and, and, and it's, it's clear to people who are operating in a similar space. And I think more and more people or advisors are, are coming uh, to understand that. The states are just not created equally. Uh, and just as, Reed, if you were to incorporate a new business, um, you probably would be advised to look at Delaware, right, mm -hmm. to right. do that. Well, it's no different in the trust space. If I came to you and uh, or you came to me or we talked about your, your need for trust, wouldn't you want to go to the best trust jurisdiction available? 
And, and this isn't a matter of opinion or this is not subjective anymore. As I, I hope we've, I hope this point has been made. This is, this is based on objective evidence now as to why some states are better than others. So, so when we encounter advisors who don't see the value because of the fact that they're not licensed in that jurisdiction or they don't have a referral relationship in that jurisdiction, or frankly, they just don't know. I know I've, and I've heard all three of those uh, objections pretty commonly. I don't think those are good answers. I think that if we, if they should know, um, mm-hmm. there's the, a, a, a plethora of information out there that, that says that they should know. So it raises some really interesting legal questions. I mean, is there a legal duty uh, on, a pa- on a part of a practitioner, uh, an attorney, an accountant, a trust professional, anybody giving advice, anybody who operates as a fiduciary, do they have an obligation to talk about different trust jurisdictions? Do they have an obligation to talk about asset protection, uh, to drill down even more? Do they have an obligation to talk about the differences between Delaware statute relative to South Dakota statute? And um, you know, for years, I actually have thought there, there was a legal duty. Um, now, however, there's some um, scholars that have actually written about it in law review articles, and there are some lower level court cases that are around in, in some of the counties around the country that have said just that, that for a practitioner to simply ignore um, issues around what is the best trust jurisdiction. I mean, we look at this example, and this is, this is about as clear as I, I guess we can get because it leads to real damages. If, if you establish a trust in Pennsylvania, and that trust is taxed at three, a little more than 3%, and that exact same trust can be established in South Dakota or Delaware or the other states that don't, don't tax trust, and, and there is no tax on that trust, and that trust uh, is not subjected to taxation, but a Pennsylvania trust is, um, that adds up to some real dollars, doesn't oh, it? Oh, yeah. I mean, uh, why not take advantage of the obvious advantages? Well, and, which, and so to me, it raises a really important question. So if, if your attorney here in Pennsylvania just didn't mention to you that if you put your trust in South Dakota, it could save you potentially millions of dollars over the mm-hmm. course of 10, 20, or the lifetime of that trust, or as we know, trust can now live forever in perpetuity under the dynasty trust provisions, that's a lot of money. And, mm-hmm. and there are charts that show this. So I guess the point is, when does it become malpractice for you not to have been told about that option? Right. And so I again, I've asked the question and the question has been answered uh, this way. Uh, and there's a, a very recent uh, law review article that, that came out um, out of a uh, law journal, I think, in, in Utah um, that talks about a um, the citation there is, is, is below. But it talks about this very question. It talks about it more in particular in, in more specifically in the idea of, of asset protection statutes. You know, um, without getting too much into the details of of the the case that it discusses and 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 the actual facts, the question on the table is: if we know that there are asset protection statutes, and we know that they're different, is there a legal duty on the part of the practitioner to point that out to the client and to steer them to the most robust asset protection statute in the country because again it just isn't an opinion anymore so let's use the example if we know that the look back period is in, in delaware is four years and we know that the look back period is in, in is two years in south dakota and the person goes for delaware because he's never been told that south dakota has a shorter look back period and two years in a day that person sued and their assets uh, are, are uh, able to be seized or, in other words, the trust is able to be pierced. And if they would have simply just gone to a jurisdiction that had a shorter look back period, that wouldn't have been the case. Why is that not malpractice? And that's what this law review article talks about. And it's the St. Mary's Legal Journal. Uh, there's a case here that talks about that and makes some distinctions. Um, feel free to anybody listening can can look at the slide and, and look for the sli- look for that do- do- um, article. Um, but it's a very very important question and it's one that I've become frankly read very passionate about. I, I think that um, we have a responsibility to our clients. Um, I, I think that uh, it's we have to stay on top and we have to be at the top of our game. And if in fact South Dakota or, 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 or Nevada has the best asset protection statute. You need to talk about that with your client. Mm-hmm. If, in fact, a, a trust that you need to establish uh, is a better situs than 
South Dakota because of tax considerations, you need to talk to your client about it. And I think as we'll, as we're as we are seeing, there are real damages for not having that conversation. Uh, so, you know, generally speaking, is there a legal duty? You know, I, I don't know if there's a court read uh, that has definitively said that, that has any real authority over anybody. Um, but I s- would suggest to you that over the next five years, uh, there's going to be an appellate court case at some point uh, that is going to make that definitive. And when I say that, I mean there's going to be a definitive duty recognized that a, an estate planner or anybody giving advice in that capacity had better document their files that they had a conversation about the various trust jurisdiction options, uh, why some are better than others, and uh, and better talk about asset protection. Dave, thank you so much. Uh, we've covered so much useful and, and great information in the, in this webinar so far. Can you just give us a, a quick recap uh, to remind people of some good takeaways? Absolutely, Reed, and thanks for uh, having me today. Um, I, Trust jurisdiction matters, and uh, I believe is vitally vitally important uh, to consider in the wealth planning process. I, I think we've made that point over and over again throughout the uh, presentation, and um, I think that perhaps might be the most important thing to consider or the most important takeaway. Uh, we talked about asset protection trusts. They are compelling. Uh, they are a compelling tool uh, to use, and, and as we talked about, there are multiple different uses for them in the planning process. Uh, it's vitally important to understand and remember that they're not all created equally or have the same benefits, so uh, the practitioner needs to understand the differences. That chart by Steve Oceans is an excellent resource, uh, and uh, and again, um, something very, very important to consider, and even just to considered at all. I mean, just not raising the idea of an asset protection trust uh, in and of itself could, could create tr- problems for a client. Um, I think that uh, using them in conjunction with or in lieu of prenuptial agreements is also an important takeaway and something to, uh, to think about with your other advisors. And really, the end of as we concluded here, the idea is, is, is there legal duty to discuss alternative trust jurisdiction and asset protection with clients in the wealth planning process, I, I think absolutely. I think unequivocally these are these are issues that, that are not going to go away. Uh, and the transient nature of, of the trust world and how each state has their own trust laws is only, is only going to make it more, more and more important. And, and again, I suspect that as we move into... Um, as we move into the next couple of years, we're going to see some court cases that actually delineate uh, this is a malpractice issue. Well, Dave, just thank you again. We really appreciate it. Um, as we had mentioned, we're going to spend some t- quick time now to answer some of the questions that have come in throughout this presentation. Uh, I'm going to leave Dave's contact information up on the screen, as well as mine. If you have any questions and would like more information on these topics, you can uh, easily get a hold of Dave. You can visit him online at bridgefordtrust.com. Um, so let's go ahead and, uh, and get into some of the Q&A. All right, Dave. Are there any questions uh, that we have that came in that, that you want to answer for us? Uh, we do have some questions, uh, Reed. I think that um, uh, two really good questions right out to, during the presentation that, that happened early, which was, I think the first one we'll take is, how, uh, how do I move an existing trust to a more favorable trust jurisdiction? Um, that's actually been asked two or three times. Um, and another question around that is, is it expensive? Um, the first uh, part of that is it's actually much easier now than it was uh, five or six years ago to move a trust from uh, a jurisdiction, let's say like Pennsylvania, that isn't as uh, advantageous as, as one like uh, South Dakota. Um, there's something called the Uniform Trust Act, and in that uh, in that law that has been uh, uh, accepted by a lot of states around the, the country, it actually creates a provision in there, um, and, and that law or that rule essentially acknowledges that um, trusts that are considered irrevocable trusts really shouldn't be trapped in a particular particular jurisdiction, and it's sort of an, uh, an outright acknowledgement that states are different, and it's better to consider, or, or it's not better to consider, it's, it's good to consider uh, an alternative trust jurisdiction. So now the law is a lot easier, and there's a couple of ways to do it. Um, in states that follow the Uniform Trust Act, there are specific provisions of just having the beneficiaries sign off uh, and, and agree to the change, um, and then uh, at that point, uh, a, a South Dakota trust company, for example, like Bridgeford, can be um, appointed by virtue of those signatures. And at that point, jurisdiction applies. And then um, the South Dakota court can amend or change uh, the document uh, in a way that um, is consistent with the wishes of the family or the uh, or the advisors. Um, so the process we're finding is, is much easier than, than people would think, and it's actually a lot less expensive. 
Um, there's another way of doing it that involves the decanting statute, which um, Pennsylvania does not have a decanting statute. A lot of states don't. Um, but decanting really is a, is a fancy way of saying um, just, just pouring over a trust into a brand new trust with brand new trust provisions. And, and, and again, a way to do that is to, uh, is to just appoint a trust company um, through the process I mentioned uh, that has um, in a state that has a decanting statute like South Dakota. And it's very easy to, uh, very easy to do that. And again, it's not very expensive. And, and quite frankly, the, the tax savings alone more than, more than uh, make up for the uh, additional legal expenses around moving the trust. Thank you, Dave. And as we had mentioned earlier, you can find Dave online at bridgefordtrust.com. We also have his email address right there on the screen, dwarren at Bridgeford Trust. Once again, Dave, thank you very much for joining us today. Hey, thanks for having me, Reed. It's been great. Thank you once again for joining us for this presentation produced by McConley and Asbury, Certified Public Accountants. We hope you join us and participate in our upcoming events. You can stay up to date with news and learn about our upcoming events by visiting us online at www.macpas.com. Thanks again and have a great day.